Before the success stories, the progress, there was you. You who made a choice to grow, to inspire, to overcome your own challenges. At NASM, we're in service of your limitless potential because when you keep growing, we all get stronger and we'll never stop making your journey our mission. Join the fitness leader. Become a fitness leader. Become a certified personal trainer. Welcome to this week's edition of the Master Instructor Roundtable. Marty Miller here with my co-host, Wendy Batts. Wendy, how are you doing today? I'm great, Marty. How are you? Good, good. It's been a fun morning already, so I'm excited to jump in here today with you on the Master Instructor Roundtable. We've got a very special guest, Dr. Mark Boff, who was a pioneer in the NBA, he was one of the first people to bring in the NESM model, whether it's the corrective exercise specialist and performance enhancement specialist into his daily life as an MBA athletic trainer. So looking forward to bringing in Dr. Mark on and talking about his career over the last 20 plus years. Yes, me too. There well, hello, is. Dr. Mark. How are you? Morning. How's everybody doing? Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you for taking the time to join us today on the Master Instructor Roundtable. Really excited to have you on. And you know what? I'm going to jump to the first question because okay. I think it's important that everybody kind of has a little understanding of your background. So can you let everyone know how you actually got in um, into what you're doing and started in with the MBA? Well, yes. Um, I'm just my disclaimer is it, I don't think it's your typical way. But the end uh, message of this all is, I think, a really good thing. Uh, I went to college as a business major, actually. And the only good business decision I made while I was in all the business classes was realizing I didn't want to be a business major. Um, at the time, I went to Brandeis University, the Boston Celtics uh, practice out of my uh, training room. And they used our gym and all the facilities and everything. And it was actually, you know, it was really cool. Uh, did my freshman season uh, with the soccer team. And then part of my package, my financial package was uh, a work study program. And during my work study program, I made 525 an hour working like, you know, doing the laundry, athletes laundry, you know, checking people in the field house and everything, uh, working in the training room, you know, making ice bags. Um, but uh, there was, I watched the, you know, this girl was helping out the Celtics and, you know, head athletic trainer and physical therapist. And he, you know, I, I was just watching him and he, for some reason, whatever, like, I mean, he was funny, he was engaging and all these things. And I talked to the girl, I got to know her and I said, Hey, who's doing your job next year? And she's like, no one. And I'm like, tell him I want your job. And uh, that kind of really started it. And the reason being is, um, again, like I really thought this guy was very engaging person. Uh, his name was Ed Lassert. Uh, and also, here's the business side of me where I'm making five twenty five an hour working for the school, doing things like laundry and stuff like that, which was, you know, all right. I could make seven fifty an hour working for him and get a T-shirt and hang out with professional athletes. So that's kind of what started me. Uh, that was my first big step into this realm. Love that. Almost a 50% raise, Mark. Well done <laughs> on you there. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, you and I have known each other for a while, and we got a similar background in the laundry days, uh, bring back fond memories of my uh, mm -hmm. journey into baseball. But I would love to hear from you when you were first introduced to the NASM OPT model. What was it that made you realize, you know, that if I implement this approach, it could lead to decreased injuries and maybe even an increase in athletic performance? Sure. So uh, I made my way, kind of paid my dues through the Celtics, volunteered in turn. Um, my first jump was not in the athletic training world, but I actually became actually way, way back. The first thing I got is I got um, a strength and conditioning certification from a different company. Uh, where at the time, it was considered, you know, uh, you know, the premier certification um, from everybody that I had talked to. Uh, but I really wanted something different. I really wanted to be on the medical side. And my boss at the time uh, kept telling me, well, there's only, you know, 28 teams. You're never going to get a job in professional sports. Do you really just want to be an athletic trainer? Maybe think about being a physical therapist. So I'm like, 
okay, let's, let me work to go to physical therapy school. So uh, I went down that route uh, after I finished with whatever degree I could finish on time, started taking all these prerequisites, went through physical therapy school, got my certification, which led to my first head job with the New Orleans Hornets as their head strength coach and physical therapist. Then uh, I was one of the last, actually, it was the last ever group of internship route athletic trainer certifications that I qualified for. And now I am a, you know, uh, like tri-certified uh, person working in the NBA. And so my approach to everything was not just, which I saw as very segmented. You were either an athletic trainer, you were either a physical therapist, which there, honestly, there was only three at the time, or you were a strength coach. And a lot of times, in a lot of situations that I watched, those things didn't overlap. And to me, it just didn't make sense. It was like, we're all working together. We're all doing the same thing. We're all managing these athletes. Like these things should all have some type of seamless overlap when you start talking about, you know, the roles of what we're doing to help an athlete. Awesome. Well, so Marty, Marty told me again, this is my first introduction to you. So I'm really excited to get to know you better. So when you decided that you were going to bring NASM and to working with your athletes, were they, how did they respond to that type of training? Cause I'm sure at the time it was completely different than what the strength and conditioning coaches were doing. Yeah. So when, all right. So I first integrated it when I was with Chicago, I was their assistant athletic trainer, head physical therapist. And the good thing at the time, our head athletic trainer, Fred Tedeschi, he had already met Mike, Mike Clark, uh, cause he was involved. He was kind of, uh, at the, he was in the NBA TA, uh, executive committee and he was involved of, you know, bringing in the speakers who spoke to us during our NBA TA summer meetings. So Fred was already integrating some of this, and that's kind of why I was really happy to get that job up there. And he wanted me because as a physical therapist, I felt I had to put my hands on everyone before they did anything. And we kind of saw that there was this, hey, we're doing these things. And I think the more Fred was learning from Mike Clark, and I hadn't uh, met him yet, and then he became our speaker that first summer, that's where it all clicked for me. And I was like, wow, somebody basically took everything I was thinking of and put this to paper and made a system that makes sense to me. And honestly, the players seem to really respond to it. And instead of, you know, just having a group throwing ice and stim on them and, you know, now we're getting hands on work. They're, you know, working, you know, they're doing myopractic work. They're opening up our joints. They're activating muscles and we feel even better getting off the table. Yeah, that's a, a great point. And again, you know, we talked about this at the beginning. You were a thought leader in that space with the NBA because that wasn't the norm when you joined. So someone has to go first. And, you know, you had some great pioneers with you, but you also helped carry that flag and, and do things differently. So we can't thank you enough from an NASM standpoint because, you know, uh, that helps validate what we're doing, right? We know that mm -hmm. when you work with elite athletes, even though a lot of us may not or all three of us have, but you know, for everybody that's taking these NASM certifications, it's great to know that this has been validated at this highest level. But um, Mark, as we shift back to your career in the NBA, which I think was over 20 years or right at 20 years, can you talk about the different roles you had and how you had to work really to get these uh, other people on the other sides of this in that integrated approach? And where do you think it is now? Is it more the standard in at least the NBA or maybe pro sports? Well, you know, I think because I came up with all with three different credentials and I kind of felt that and when I'm looking back, like Ed kind of groomed me, he's like, you should have this, you should have this. And he, he kind of, he was, he was really the first, like, you know, like thought leader that says, if I can speak all these different languages, then I can communicate with everybody. I can do every role. And I ended up having the head role of all these roles. So for me, it just, I, Part of it was luck. I guess maybe it was my credentials. I, I don't know. But I was able to sit at the head of each one of these positions. And for me at the time, you know, when I got my first job actually running the entire sports medicine program, I looked at that as like, okay, I'm in a position now where I understand each role really in depth. Okay. I'm becoming now more of a generalist because of what the role, you know, and more of a managerial role. I went from probably, you know, 90% hands-on work as, uh, you know, either the assistant or the head physical therapist to as the, you know, the director of sports medicine, you know, the other, those guys who are, you know, doing less of the administrative stuff are doing more hands-on stuff. So I said, 
look, I need somebody as strong as possible in each of those particular chairs, uh, you know, putting this team together, but also having a good understanding of what each and uh, you know other's role is, so we can constantly talk the same, so we can constantly sit back in and you know, you know, assess, reflect, progress, and all, everybody's on the same page. And that's kind of what really what I looked at as a really important thing. I didn't even think of it as like an integrated approach. I just said, you know, if we're if we're creating a team here. We have to have everybody understand everybody else's role because that just was simple, you know, team building strategy. And and that way things are going to work seamlessly because, you know, we can kind of pass some stuff off and we don't have to really lose time explaining it, it things. And it, it, it just everybody, you know, bought into each other. And I actually what I did when I ran it, I was like, who was the best athletic trainer I can get? Who's the best strength coach I can get? And, you know, and, and that's what I look for because I wanted somebody really strong you know, at their particular skill set with that understanding of what everyone else is doing on the team. And it just really made things at the Milwaukee Bucks with our group. Like, you know, it, it made it a great working environment. It was very seamless. You know, did we have a few, you know, interesting, you know, situations where injuries that, you know, are not common that we had to spend a little bit more time, you know, researching and talking about and, and learning different things to do? Absolutely. But when you have that integrative approach and everybody understands everyone else's role and, and we all can speak the same language, it really helps. It really helps when everybody's on the same page for sure and uh, mm -hmm. making sure everyone's on board. And today on the Master Instructor uh, Roundtable with myself, Wendy Batts, here with my co-host, Marty Miller, and we have very special guest, Dr. Mark Boff, talking to us. Mark, you know, you talked a lot about you went to school for business, you changed your mind, you became a physical therapist, you've worked in the MBA. I know since then you have had so many different unique opportunities, especially in wellness and fitness. So can you kind of tell us how do you, can you highlight, because I know that you've been on TV, you've been in movies. Can you highlight how all that, how that happened for you? Um, honestly, it, it, it all, it, it, it was luck. So a lot of it was luck and being in the right place at the right time and actually getting fired at the right time. So, you know, in the NBA there, you know, a lot of times they don't really fire you. They just don't renew your contract. So I'm at the end of my contract with the Milwaukee Bucks and I, I got let go very late in the hiring season. And at that time there was no more lateral moves and there was only at the t going from a, the, the head of the department to just a strength coach role because there was only two left open in the league. I, you know, it was kind of a step down in roles and, but you have to, as I tell everybody, if you have uh, like um, an opportunity, you have to listen. You have to hear somebody out, right? You'll always gain something out of it, even if it's something you don't want to do. I find it's very important to always do that. So I was traveling to two cities and uh, to, to go talk to the teams. And one of them happened to be in California. And I get it the day before I'm leaving. I get a call about a TV show in Los Angeles. And I'm like, I have no idea about your world. But coincidentally, I'll be in California tomorrow. If you want to fly me up in two days, I'll come listen. So, uh, you know, I, I saw the team, then I went up to LA and I come back and I'm just sitting around and thinking about it. And I'm like, well, I really don't want to go to either of these two teams because I don't want to move to these cities for a lateral, you know, for a step down job. So I'm like, you know what? They want me in LA for eight weeks. I'll go out there, you know, I'll come home. I've always had my own business on the side for probably at this point, about 11 years, like seeing clients on the side and I'll just do that. And, you know, I'll wait till the next hiring season. Cause it was at that point, maybe seven months away. And, um, I went, I did the TV show again, never even, I heard of it. I had no idea what the premise was until we started talking about it. And, you know, it was overseeing, it was a, a, you know, a reality TV game show and it was overseeing, you know, the patients, you know, it, you know, health and care and, and all that. And, it, you know, the doctor who found me, he was a personality on the show and he was the kind of medical doctor overseeing everything, but he wasn't there every day. And I would see his clients uh, on our dark days. We weren't shooting because he had an internal medicine practice in Beverly Hills. And he's like, hey, I can throw you a lot of business, you know, if you want to. And I'm like, sure, because I'm out there without my wife and just killing time. So I started to see all these people. And it's like, you know, lower level celebrities, very wealthy people, you know, because it's an internal medicine practice in Beverly Hills. And then three days before I'm about to the show's about to wrap and I'm about to go back to Milwaukee. He's like, you know, I got this guy uh, I could really use your help with if you give me two weeks after we wrap and, uh, you know, it will, you know, 
it, it would really help me out. So, you know, I'm like, sure, I'll stay. Here I am in this house in Malibu in the hills with this really wealthy, you know, famous doctor. And in what it's, 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 it's no, it's Halloween of 2013 at like midnight. And literally in walks this A-list actor who I recognize right away. And he's known for, you know, he's an action hero guy. He's known for taking his shirt off and, you know, all these things. But he had been beat down from all his roles and he had a, he had five movies coming up and he had to be very active and he needed somebody to be able to train him at, at the first movie. He had to put on like 35 pounds of muscle, but he had all these injuries. So being a physical therapist and, a, and, a, you know, and a strength coach, I could do this. So I was like, all right. And we worked together twice a day for a week. And he goes, I got five movies around the world. Do you want to go with me? And I'm like, uh, can I bring my wife? And he's like, sure, I don't care. So, and, uh, you know, that, that kind of started it all off. And, uh, but I did spend the next four years trying to get back into the NBA for some reason. Um, because again, I did, I put 20 years of sacrifice and hard work to work to where I did in the NBA. And here I'm thinking like, wow, that is what defines me. I'm really good at it. But, you know, in, some of the some of the hiring seasons I missed because I was out of the country with this actor. But then the other two, like it just there was nothing there and nothing, you know, materialized for me to get a job, nor in a city I would want to go live in or move to. And finally, we're literally, and I'll say it like this, we're on a boat in the middle of the Greek islands. And my wife looks at me and says, Do you really want to go back into professional sports? Look at where you are and look at what you're doing. Because again, I'm just taking clients in in LA just to pass the time and to pay bills. I didn't realize I was building this business, but my phone kept ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing. And all of a sudden I realized I have a pretty interesting client base and I'm flying all over the world with them. And and at that point it was like, okay, no more sports. I mean, I, I worked with athletes on the outside. I would, you know, talk to the agents, talk to their trainers if they needed help and stuff like that. And they would send me their clients. But that was it. I I, I kind of never looked back. Again, luck. <laughs> you know, that, that's great information. And I think that's great for all of our audience here who thinks they want to go down a certain career path. I had a similar journey where I ended up in professional baseball and it opened up a lot of opportunities that I went down a different path and thank goodness. Right. So sometimes the best opportunities are the ones that don't present themselves because it forces you to look differently, open your eyes to something new that you may not have thought about that could be greater or at least greater for you. So that's Excellent information there, Mark. So you kind of must have read my next question or read my mind. So I was going to ask you here, and I think that now is still a good time, is how is the corrective exercise specialist or CPT and then the PES for sure methodology has been beneficial and kind of air quotes your non-athletic population. But Wendy and I always talk about everybody's an athlete and you had the movie star who needed to be treated like an athlete. So how have those credentials helped you in your non-professional sports role? Well, I'd actually like to take that uh, exactly what you said a step forward. Every single person who walks the face of this earth is an is an athlete because if you're moving, you're at, you, you're that's that's being an athlete, right? Now we sometimes just look at being an athlete as someone who's training or playing a sport, but that doesn't just define being an athlete. So that's the whole point. No matter who I'm working with, whether they're a sedentary businessman. Uh, whether they're a high level athlete, an action hero, an entertainer. Um, I, I mean, I've worked with literally, a, you know, a, a researcher that all he does is research, but they're athletes. They're sitting down, they're standing up, they're moving around their lab, they're picking up equipment, they're moving it to one side. So, literally, I approach everybody the same exact way. The only time that changes is what are they doing after I get them off the table? And that's when it comes in what their day to day activity is. And that's the only change. So that's why kind of like that CES is the central component of everything I do. And the same thing with the OPT models. What are they training for after it? Are they training for their job? Are they training for a sport? Are they training to perform? And that is the only difference. That's where you start to individualize it to what the activity needs is. But the human body is the human body. You know, we have the same issues. Is it an injury? Is it a dysfunctional movement pattern? What is it? And and and, and that's why the CES has truly been of all the certifications, uh, besides my PT license, because obviously that helped me dig really deep in a higher level knowledge base. But that also made me understand how important the CES was and also 
again, Dr. Clark was brilliant in his group of saying, here's this scenario. Like if you look at these data points and I know everyone talks data right now in sports science, it's a whole nother thing, but we can simplify what data points we're looking at because the human body is the human body. And then if we have to go with higher level stuff, then we can bring in the more advanced data points and work off that. But again, at the end of the day, the CES, because of the way it streamlines into getting a person ready for whatever they need to be ready for, you know, that's why I, that's, that's always been my go-to. It's the main tool in my toolbox. And I've kind of adjusted it a little bit that works, works, works best for me and my business model. But look, I, I just try to sell, tell everybody, the most important thing you can do is build as big of a toolbox as you can get, get as much experience as you can get. Because again, you never know who's going to call you and say, hey, I need you to do this. I, and I was prepared for it. That's awesome. I love it. Marty and I say that all the time. The CES, I think, has been our bread and butter because you know, Marty just said it. I've said it. We work with professional athletes, but most of them come to us because they're, quote, broken and yep. we need it to try to fix them. And the CES has been, I know, a huge, huge uh, kind of asterisk in my career of, of mm -hmm. being able to help someone move better so they feel better and obviously perform at their higher, highest level, no matter who they are or what they're doing. But, you know, it's interesting because I listened to this story, Mark, about how you started, where you started. And there's so many similarities to Marty, myself and so many other trainers that have reached out to us and, and talked to us. But then it's like, Marty's like, well, you need to read even more on this guy. And so uh -oh. I know that there's something that you do about a specific approach dealing with trauma and addiction and how that fits into wellness and fitness. So can you talk to us a little bit about how you go from what you're doing on a boat, you just say, okay, no more MBA. And then now you're going down this, this path. Yeah. Uh, again, it was the opportunity found me. Um, I had a client I was traveling with and he was, and I knew nothing about this population until you get to LA, there's this population out there being in the program. And one of my clients was in the program and he had to have a sober companion traveling with him. And at the time, um, you know, I, basically whenever I worked with this client, got him moving, got him up, had did some things, and then he did his stuff for his, you know, the trauma addiction side of what he needed to do. Uh, he was better at it, I guess. And that's, as it comes back and it's told to me, because the sober companion pulled me aside one day and said, look, whatever you're doing with this person, okay, before I, I work with him, before it's my turn to work with him, he's in a, such a better place. And, it, and, it, and, and things that I need to do, you know, are, are more efficient and they're getting done better. And he's, you know, he goes, look, I, I'm, you know, I'm opening a facility and I would love for whatever you do with him, just come do that at my facility. And I'm like, oh, I really don't know much. Again, and I, I don't really know much about your world. So, but I'm like, okay. And I did. And, you know, we opened up this facility in, uh, in Ocala, Florida. And, uh, when the doors were finally opened, it's, I, I went down there and I started seeing what they're doing. And I met his partner, who's one of the world's foremost trauma therapists. And she's this incredible lady who has an incredible story. Uh, so did, so did the sober companion. who's a, a really good friend of mine at this point. He's a very, you know, both these people are very, you know, big names in their industry. And, um, you know, they're like, look, tell us what you need. Tell us what you want. Just just do what you do. And when I'm, I'm now I'm starting to meet more and more of these people who are in these facilities and they all have pain and they all have inflammation and they all have anxiety and then and they all have tissue issues. And I'm just like, well, uh, those are every all my athletes in the NBA. So why can't everything I used in the NBA all these modalities and all these skill sets and all these tools, why can't we use it here? Okay. And that's what I just started doing. And the problem was there. Um, my gym space there was, so this property was like a 28 acre horse farm. And all I got was a stall in a barn that I could put some mats down in. That was like a, I don't know, like a 150 square foot space. But, um, you know, we started there because they only had seven people at a time could, that, and that when they considered their full and how many people that they, they can take care of. And um, 
what I basically found is like the most important thing in because what they're teaching a lot of is this mind body spirit connection, this holistic connection, which is really important, which is what we do in sports, which is what we do in our everyday life with everyone else. But because they're therapists and doctors in a different space, who's who, there's there's very few people who have any understanding of of how to handle the physical side of the mind body spirit connection. You know, some people were doing yoga out there and some people did have not, some decent gyms and some people were getting massages, but there was no real standard of care. So I'm like, this is what's needed. There needs to be a standard of care. There needs to be kind of like a movement specialist who can sit on these interdisciplinary teams when we're talking about these people, because, you know, and this was, you know, probably, you know, nine years ago now. And, and all of a sudden in the last three, four years, I know it was out there, but, but it was very buried, but now you're starting therapists to see having their sessions instead of on couches, they're going for walks with their clients. Because the minute you start to move, we know how much that relaxes, you know, the nervous system. So all of a sudden the anxiety is not there and people don't feel as locked down when they're trying to get heavy stuff out. So anything we can do to get people moving is the most important part. And then it's just, it was starting to tailor that to the particular, you know, places they were in their, their, what we'd call their, you know, addiction journey. Are they just starting? Are they elite athletes that haven't trained for 10 years? Are they eating disorder people? Are they, you know, PTSD people? And we're starting to figure out how to take the, you know, the obstacles of them getting moving again, because it's a huge component for people, as we all know, who've stopped, who've let themselves go, or who've gone through a lot of stress and trauma that they basically just lock down, right? And their bodies feel terrible and they don't like the way their bodies change and their shame and regret and all these things. But, you know, I do more wellness programming and that's what I teach. And we're lucky to have an amazing female trainer down there who can train at the highest level and the lowest level all at the same time. But all it is, is like resetting people's, the philosophies or the principles that have been stuck in their heads and say, hey, it doesn't matter what you've done to this point to your body you can start now and you can get better and you're going to feel better and you're going to move through this process and this journey. You know, the more you do here by moving your body, the more it's going to help you moving forward in everything you're trying to work on right now. Now, Dr. Mark, that's great information. And for those of you just joining in today on the Master Instructor Roundtable, Marty Miller here, my co-host, Wendy Batts, we're talking with Dr. Mark Boff, who is uh, legendary in the NBA with the, getting the OPT model uh, integrated but also now going on to different uh, journeys throughout his career. And Mark, I think the, the takeaway for me from a lot of this is one, everyone's an athlete. We know that we got to treat everybody that way, but also the joy that we can bring to people just by getting them in better health, whether it's an elite athlete, whether it's people in the trauma addiction space that we know fitness wellness is one of the best medicines out there. And that's exciting that we get to share in that with so many people. So my final question for you, Mark, is where do you see your career going next as well as the fitness and wellness industry? And I know I know that you and I get to work on a really cool project together. So I'll let you throw that in there with Dr. Mike Clark. But I love this, you know, see where you think things are headed. Well, you know, let me step back. And, and I think one of our other jobs as, you know, fitness, health, wellness professionals, whatever you want to call ourselves, is what I've seen really happen in the last 10 to 15 years is the amount of things that are come to market and they come to market fast. And especially now with, you know, social media, these trends all get thrown out, right? Oh, you got to do this or you got to take that, or this is the only way to work out, or this is the only piece of equipment you need. And I think a big part of our job is to help our clients kind of sift through that because those things that they hear and getting marketed you know, all this marketing stuff slammed into their head are really creating a bunch of the obstacles of what's good for them, what's healthy for them, what's what's real science and things like that. So I'd say, you know, in in kind of throwing that in there, what I really started to do when I started, quote unquote, consulting in the trauma addiction world is say, all right, you know, uh, I'm in a position where I get to, you know, talk to a lot of people who are bringing a lot of things to market, product services in the health and fitness and wellness industry. And, you know, I've always been, uh, if you can't tell, I can't sit still and I'm always open to anything new. And so I really just said, all right, you know, uh, you know, I'd like to start doing more and more consulting, advising and stuff like that. So, you know, this part of my career, I kind of see is more like um, where I'm going. Number one, I don't really know. 
Uh, I like to kind of leave that open because I never want to kind of put constraints on myself uh, because, again, you just never know what the phone call tomorrow or the email tomorrow is going to bring. But I really am, am looking forward to working with scientifically, you know, backed evidence based products and services that can help our population as a whole. And uh, like you said, that's one of the, pro uh, you know, the projects you and uh, uh, Dr. Mike Clark and I are working on, which is kind of amazing. And I think it's going to bring a lot of people, a lot of positive, you know, healthy, you know, success, uh, you know, depending upon what's going on. But I just feel now that we've kind of conquered a lot of these things, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in like, what, how can I take a project that I can, because I can't, as a practitioner, I can only help one person at a time. But what can I do to maximize how many people I can help at a time? And those are the things I'm really looking forward to doing. And, you know, I, I feel that, you know, they're going to continue. I'm a firm believer, like, you know, if you just, if you speak your passion, then other people are going to hear you as opposed to telling people what they need to do. And that kind of creates some, some noise. And I just feel if you're continuing to speak your passion, you know, other things come and find you just like, you know, the Hollywood world came to find me. Then the trauma addiction world came to find me. It's not like I went looking for them. And again, I, I never thought I was going to stay in LA and do this. I never created a business card. I never went online to do social media. I just literally kept saying yes when the phone rang and saying, how can I help you? I love it. And and I know Marty and I, we attribute a lot of what we, our success to luck as well, just being at the mm -hmm. right, right place, right time. Uh, Dr. Clark was my mentor right out of college. So when I felt like I knew a lot, I met him and realized I didn't know anything. <laughs> and so I had to uh, start my education and fitness journey um, with mm -hmm. him, which then led, led myself personally to the NASM OPT model that I've used throughout my entire career. But, you know, my final question to you, Dr. Mark, is this, you know, we've got a lot of inspiring trainers, people that have been been maybe in a different career and that have come over and decided that they wanted to become a personal trainer. We have a lot of people that are veteran trainers that listen to us and ask us wonderful questions all the time. But if you had to leave our, our listeners with one final thought of how they can maybe even get the opportunities that you have had, or if you have some words of advice and wisdom that you could leave us, I would greatly appreciate that. Well, uh, <laughs> I, you know, it's, there's so many things to say, but to try and break it down is, um, don't ever think something that comes across your plate is not worth learning. And always say, always explore an opportunity, at least hear a person out. Because again, you know, and I'll give you, for instance, in the NBA, part of our job at the time was to be the on, because we travel with the team, the athletic trainer traditionally was also kind of like the on-site travel guy. So we would have to know everything about everything about talking to the plane people and the hotel people. And I'm learning about LOPAs and seat maps and all these other things. And, you know, I never thought, I'm like, uh, why, why? You know, it's just another thing that I have to do right now. And then all of a sudden, my next career where I'm working with people and their assistants and they're like, hey, do you think you can, you, like, you, you're not doing anything right now while we're in the middle of Saudi Arabian desert, but I'm trying to arrange a plane to get us to, you know, UAE. Do you think you can kind of go over like that whole plane, you know, schematics and scenario to make sure it's what our needs are? And I'm like, okay. And, and they're sending me these things. And now I understand because I already learned about elope and everything. So again, I'm a physical therapist. Never thought I'd have to learn anything about a plane. And here's a situation where I became valuable to this other teammate, even though she wasn't a healthcare professional, but it was part of his team in the time where I could step in and help out because it's something I learned a while back and I was able to have an understanding, you know, and get involved. So it, it, again, and, and I, I kind of did this in physical therapy school. This is the only time I really screwed up. I so wanted this point was I so wanted to be in the NBA. I kind of had this mindset of, and I fought all my professors and, and, and my advisor. And I'm like, I only want to do orthopedic classes and I only want to be in orthopedic internships, you know, and, and that's it. And they're like, no, you have to go and do a peds and you have to go and do subacute. And I'm like, I'm never going to use that. Right. And, but lo and behold, I've pretty much used everything. I was asked to look at an eight year old. Okay. Never thought I would because all I wanted to do was be in the NBA. But here I am. 
and all these other things come across my plate. And if you have the tools, even if they get a little rusty, they're still there and it's not your first time and you're not like, oh my God, what do I do? So I would always continue to learn. I would always, even if something doesn't make sense, learn a little bit about it. And then if you get a call or an email about an opportunity, at least explore it. You can always say no, even at the last minute before you say yes, if it doesn't work for you. That's what I would say. Yeah, great, great advice, Dr. Mark. I think the key thing is be a, a lifelong passionate learner and mm -hmm. start stacking things up. You never know where it's going to come out. So we mm -hmm. can't thank you enough for one, your loyalty to NASM and being a pioneer, mm -hmm. bringing this into pro sports, because that has definitely helped validate everything that Dr. Clark, uh, you know, researched and put together. So thank you for that. And for all of you that uh, joined us here today on the Master Instructor Roundtable, we can't thank you enough for your time. Wendy, as always, it's fun chatting with you. Never know where the conversations are going to go. So thank you. And for all of you, we absolutely look forward to seeing you next week on the Master Instructor Roundtable.